thank you very much everyone for uh, joining uh, me today on this online uh, presentation. Um, so as Lena said, uh, my name's Letitia and I'm the current Chadwick Biodiversity Fellow at the Australian Museum in Sydney. Um, so the Chadwick Biodiversity Fellowship is a fellowship um, for early career researchers um, to study um, at the Australian Museum, so it's a really great opportunity. Today I'm going to talk to you about um, part of the Chadwick, um, the research I've been doing as part of the Chadwick Biodiversity Fellowship. Um, it's going to be divided into two parts. Um, the first part is going to be about a cruise that I went on in 2018 to the Tasmanian underwater mountains. And the second part is about the research that we're doing on the specimens uh, from that research voyage. So as I said, um, part one is just a summary about the Tasmanian Seamount survey. Um, about a year ago, Ingo and I actually gave a presentation on this survey. Um, but during the uh, expedition, there are actually some journalists on board. And I want to share with you today some of the videos that the journalists put together from that voyage. The second part is going to be about the research that I'm doing on the deep sea annelids uh, from the Australian abyss, uh, so from different areas around Australia in the deep sea. So the first part um, is the Seamount Coral Survey. This was um, two Tasmanian seamounts and it was back in November, December 2018. And it was a month long voyage um, to map cold water coral communities and their associated marine life on the Tasmanian seamounts. So this cruise was led by CSIRO, uh, Parks Australia, and it was on board the um, RV Investigator. On board, there were 40 scientists, technicians, and marine park managers and communication specialists. And there was also a team of journalists. And it's those videos um, that the journalists put together that I want to share with you today, because I think they're really good. Um, so the journalists also put together a blog, um, which I'll share with you the details afterwards, and um, some short films about the research going on board the ship. So there's going to be two films, um, that, two videos that I'm going to share with you today. They're each about uh, four minutes long and they're, I think, really interesting. And the participants from the Australian Museum uh, were myself and Francesco on the first leg and Ingo and Alison on the second leg of the voyage. Um, so the first, uh, first of all, the RV investigator. So what is it? Um, it's a research vessel um, operated by CSIRO. It's about 94 metres in length. It was launched in 2014 and it's quite costly to run. Um, so every day it costs around $140,000 per day at sea to run. Um, so obviously if it's this expensive, um, the, the samples and the data that we get from the voyage are really valuable. And we're really lucky at the Australian Museum to have received quite a few of those deep sea samples. So the first video that I'm going to show to you um, is about three minutes long and it's about the cameras that they used on board the RV investigator to visualise the marine life. We are on the way to the Huon and Tasman Fracture Marine Parks, south of Tasmania. We're here to study deep sea coral communities living on an unusually large group of underwater mountains known as seamounts. Laying eyes on the hidden world of deep sea corals is a challenging endeavour. The high-tech camera kit we're using on this seamount survey is the eighth version designed and built by CSIRO over the last 20 years. For survey chief scientist Alan Williams from CSIRO, these cameras are his eyes on the sea floor. This will be the third visit to this area. It was surveyed first in the late 90s and again a decade later in 2006. The surveys themselves are quite complicated. Each camera transect runs down a seamount from its peak to its base.
we need careful navigation and we need very careful piloting of the camera platform as it moves through the water. The vessel is towing the camera down the continental margin adjacent to the seamounts area. This map here, the underlay shows the seabed topography. The two um, symbols you can see here, the first one is the ship and the second one behind it is the tow camera with a beacon on it that transmits the position of the camera back to the ship. Imagine having the job of flying the deep tow camera at the end of thousands of metres of cable, just two metres above the sea floor. This is the latest generation of the CSIRO Ocean and Atmospheres towed camera platform. Carl Forsey and Jeff Cordell of CSIRO are two of the pilots on this survey. They absolutely love their work, including its many challenges. With the latest cameras, we're able to control them via Ethernet from the surface. We're able to mount them in specially CNC machined housings to take 3D stereo imagery of the seafloor. And of course, cameras are a lot higher resolution these days. There's much better light sensitivity. So we're able to take advantage of all those features in our cameras and get the absolute best quality photos up on the surface in real time. When we're looking at new discoveries, species that have never been seen before by anyone, and you're controlling that with a joystick. It's a really good feeling. 10 years ago, a remote controlled deep diving vehicle from the United States placed nine granite settlement plates at the base of Sisters Seamount in the Huon Marine Park. The settlement plates provide precise locations for scientists to monitor new coral growth. But finding them again in 1,000 metres of water requires the utmost teamwork, dexterity and patience. A drop camera deployed beneath the ship relays the view of the remote sea floor back to Alan and the camera pilot in the operations room. While the pilot can move the camera up and down, the only way to search side to side is to move the entire ship. Guided by the camera and a map of the sea floor, Alan communicates with the skipper on the bridge, who makes tiny adjustments using the ship's dynamic positioning system. James, could you take us four metres east, please? <laughs> Yep. Thank you. After many hours of manoeuvring, the settlement plates are spotted and the camera is coaxed close enough to take a clear image. Well, we found them. This time, the settlement plates show no sign of new coral growth confirming the suspicion that these deep sea reefs will take a very long time to recover from damage. That's a good enough look to uh, I'm going to conclude there's nothing on it. Seeing the images coming up from the sea floor 1,000 metres below us is quite extraordinary. All of the information and data that's acquired through these voyages, it's made freely available to researchers all over the country and all over the world to help make decisions about future management of these places and places like them around the world. These deep sea cameras show us how deep sea coral communities change predictably with depth and the kind of substrate available for them to attach to. The camera allows us to view the animals remotely, but for a better understanding, we need to take a closer look. Many of the uh, organisms that we work on at the museum are actually too small to be seen by cameras. Um, so how do we investigate those? Um, well, one of the main ways that we investigated those small animals on the RV investigator was using a beam trawl and collecting lots of organisms uh, from a trawl. And then our job um, as um, sorters was to go through and sort those organisms into um, as, as far as we could. So species where uh, possible, um, but usually high taxa. And so the next video um, that I'm going to show you is um, how we sorted the beam trawl samples. We are on the way to the Huon and Tasman Fracture Marine Parks, south of Tasmania. We're here to study deep sea coral communities living on an unusually large group of underwater mountains known as seamounts. 
Here on Investigator, biological samples are collected so we can better understand the animals that call this reef home. Many of the animals that live in the deeper areas of marine parks are unknown to scientists or can't be identified from underwater video footage. To better understand what species live where, physical samples are collected using the beam troll, a small sampling net that is towed along the sea floor. When the troll comes in, it's action station. The biologists wait eagerly for this moment, excited by the prospect of something no one has ever seen before. This is Investigator's wet lab, where biologists sort, label and preserve animals collected from the Hewan and Tasman Fracture Marine Parks. Candace Untide from CSIRO is in charge of the 2pm to 2am shift on board the vessel. She runs the lab when a beam troll is conducted in these hours. So you've seen us bring up a beam troll to this really mixed bag of animals of all different kinds. And then we spend quite a long time sorting them into things that look alike and we identify them as far as possible. We separate them out, we preserve them, and we give them a unique number so we can trace that data back. And then specialists take those animals and identify them even further. Many of the specimens we collect on the voyage will end up here. This beautiful coral in front of me was collected from a seamount in the Hewan Marine Park. It's now held in the TMAG collection to be used in further research. These animals live in cold, dark environments, clinging to the rocky sides of seamounts far beneath the ship. Coral communities are the heroes of this mysterious world because they provide caves, tunnels and scaffolding for other animals to hide in and live on. Kiralee Moore of the Tasmanian Museum and Art Gallery has spent a lot of time getting to know them. The octocorals are part of the larger, diverse ecosystem that we know exists in these cold water habitats. And some of them are quite, stand quite tall, some of them grow over things, some of them are soft, some hard. Um, so it provides a huge variety of different substrates, different textures, different abilities for things to grow with and in or on. To see the specimens while they're fresh is a completely different experience to when they have been preserved. Alexandra yeah. Weaver acquainted with a common resident of these deep sea reefs, the brittle star. There are more than 2,000 species of brittle stars. Yeah. Brittle stars are characterized by a, a round disc, so that's the center of the body, and it yeah. has also five, uh, usually five arms. And uh, here in the middle, you can see that uh, there's the mouth, so that's where they feed. This one is uh, quite interesting because it is always found in association with a deep sea coral. Uh, so you can find it here. That's uh, how we found it uh, from the beam troll. So it was really closely uh, attached to, uh, to the coral. And um, at night, it uh, extends its arm in the water column and it uh, feeds on the particles that uh, are in the water. And it can also feed on the particles that are deposited on the corals. And uh, like that, it also helps uh, the coral to be clean of uh, particles. Karen Gallat Holmes from CSIRO joined her first research voyage more than 40 years ago, giving her a unique and invaluable perspective. Because this is an ongoing series of expeditions that date back to 1997. So we are still using photographs that date back to that date. So what we're looking for is things we haven't seen before or that are better than what we've seen before to try and record the colours. We're still learning a lot about these and in the sort of sampling methods that we use, we are not in a situation being able to pluck individual things up or spot them in situ. So uh, this is the best way that we can to actually record it. Identifying individual animals is an exciting and complex process. Sedentary or slow moving animals are easily collected and sampled, but for faster movements such as eels or fish, we need a different strategy. Okay, so here are some other um, images of fauna that was particularly abundant in the beam trolls. And we found lots of corals, uh, squat lobsters. And here you can see a little um, annelid worm attached to some uh, corals. We also found, um, I've put some more pictures of annelid worms on the right because that's what I'm interested in. Um, also gastropods, um, sea snails, and some solitary cold water, um, solitary corals down here. 
OK, so part two is um, talking about the study that um, we've been doing here at the museum um, on all the annelids uh, collected from these deep sea voyages. Um, so we've been quite lucky, actually. There's quite a few um, recent um, voyages to the deep sea around Australia. Um, there was the Eastern um, Australia um, voyage where they travelled from Tasmania up to southern Queensland and collected samples from um, Bathiel and Abyssal environments. And also the Great Australian Bite was sampled in 2015 and 2017. And many of these, uh, the samples from these voyages were deposited at the Australian Museum. Uh, the work that I'm doing focuses on the annelids. So these are the marine segmented worms. Um, these include uh, groups such as cypoglinids, echiurans, and also along with the traditionally accepted polychaetes. So um, these annelids are actually very dominant in deep sea sediments, and they're important for burying organic matter and recycling nutrients. They're also important for bioturbation of sea force sediments, uh, which is where they, um, by burrowing into the sediments, they introduce oxygen into deeper down layers where oxygen wouldn't usually reach. On so far in Australia, um, from the Atlas of Living Australia, um, which has all the records um, for organisms around Australia, um, there were 158,000 records of annelids in Australia. However, only a thousand of those um, were from below 1,000 metres water depth. So this means there's probably quite a lot of understudied uh, biodiversity for these deeper specimens. I've put up a map here taken from a recent publication, O'Hara et al, um, just to show you um, where they went on the Eastern Abyssal voyages. Um, so starting from Tasmania, going up to Southern Queensland and also the Great Australian Bight voyages. Um, so we have really good um, samples from those areas. And O'Hara et al um, looked at the benthic megafauna. So these are larger animals that you can usually spot in video and camera footage, such as sponge, barnacles, decapods and ophioids. And they found um, 666 operational taxonomic units and they could put names to 251 of those species. And they thought that around 60% of the fauna was undescribed. They, were, they also found a high richness in the southeast um, Australia. And there's a study on uh, decapods, and they recorded 191 species and, um, from these areas, and 19% of these were undescribed. And they found that at upper bathial depths, um, there was an increase in diversity with a decreasing latitude. So that's what we've seen for other fauna, and I wanted to see um, what we can see uh, for polychaetes. Does this apply to polychaetes as well? So the annelids, um, so I say polychaetes, the polychaetes are annelids. Um, so the annelids were sorted to families at the Australian Museum. And then we identified the species that we could, um, but some groups uh, we sent abroad to tax taxonomic specialists. Um, so in total, um, the publication that I'm working on at the moment, um, we've got a collaboration of 30 co-authors um, from 18 institutions around the world. Um, this includes Germany, UK, Italy, Poland, Norway, USA, China and Japan, and that's taxonomic specialists working on their specialist group of annelids. And in total, at the moment, we've got around uh, 5,700 spe specimens, and at my last count, we have 261 species of worm, and around 50% of these are new to science. And generally, um, we've been finding quite a high species richness um, in the Bass Strait near Tasmania and a lower richness uh, off Fraser Island. Obviously, there's quite a few new species um, that are undescribed, around 140. And I'm not going to go through all of them. I thought I'd just um, take a selection of the most, um, some of the interesting uh, ones or ones that have been described um, to date. Um, so on the left here, we have a species of pectinarids, and these are also known as ice cream cone worms um, because they form tubes that look a bit like ice cream cones. And that was described um, by researchers here at the Australian Museum, uh, Pat, Lena and Jing, a Chinese student, and they named it um, Peta investigatoris after the RV investigator. Um, the next one, D, um, we have a 
Sablerid, and I know that's um, in progress, and I think they're going to name it after Tim O'Hara, um, the leader of the scientific uh, crew on the ship. Uh, the next one, uh, we have a species of amphoretid. These are the ones that I um, study in particular. So amphoretids generally live in tubes, um, so you wouldn't, um, this one's been taken out of its tube, and normally all you'd see poking out are the branchiae here that it uses to breathe and its feeding tentacles, its buccal tentacles. And we've got, um, at the moment, two new species of melanopsis, which are currently being described. And these little ones here are um, Dorvaleids um, from the genus Ophiotroca, and they're generally found around organically enriched environments. And you can, they can often be very small, and you can see here um, their little jaws. Um, to the bottom left, we have a species of stenapsids. Uh, these stenapsids are often called, um, commonly called mud owls um, because um, they look a bit like owls. Um, so they have these colourful ventrocordial shields here, which look a bit like an owl's eye, and their body shape apparently looks like an owl when it's resting. We also have new species of um, polynoid, which are scale worms. So there's a, a scale worm here. Its scales have dropped off, but they're at the bottom here. Um, so we have a new species of harmathuri and new species of anufids. Um, so anufids uh, live in tubes and they can form tubes out of shells and bits of sediment. And they're quite selective about these tubes, about where they put the different shapes of shells. Um, so you can see it's put its larger ones the larger shells on the dorsal and uh, ventral side. OK, so um, hopefully after the study that uh, we've been working on, uh, we're going to have a good publication of all the Australian deep sea annelids um, from the eastern abyss um, and comparing those with um, ones from the Great Australian Bight. And this will include digital images and short species descriptions. Um, and this is really important um, to provide these new records of annelids um, in uh, Australian waters. Uh, many of the samples were taken from Australian marine parks and a lot of baseline data for the smaller um, invertebrates is missing for these areas. So um, this will give a lot of good data um, to help managers in the future. The Great Australian Bight is actually um, thought to be uh, one of the world's um, most prospective underexplored oil and gas um, provinces. Um, so it is thought that oil and gas um, mining and um, looking for it um, is going to happen in the Great Australian Bight. So it's good to get details of what fauna is living in that area before it's explored um, for those purposes. And the Australian Museum has a fantastic collection of deep sea material, and a lot of that material is fixed in ethanol, um, which is really good um, because we can use it for molecular work. The next part, um, so after this publication, I'm hoping to work on the genetic connectivity of um, amphoretids um, across uh, eastern Australia and um, the Great Australian Bight, which is South Australia. I uh, just want to say thank you very much to all the crew and scientists on board all the investigator voyages for which um, I'm using material from. Um, so that's the um, Eastern Voyages and the Tasmanian Sea Bounce. All the collaborators, so the 30 collaborators around the world in the Australian Museum and um, other parts of the globe that have been helping me put together um, this large manuscript of all the records of the annelids from the deep sea. Um, the Marine Invertebrate Collection Team for sending all the packages to those people all around the world. And also volunteers Tony, Wed Wendy and Greg um, for sorting through some of the preliminary samples with me. And also Susan, who's been great with Photoshop. And I wanted to thank Megan for putting this all together. I know we've had lots of trial runs um, trying to get teams working. And if you're interested and want to read the blog, I've put the link below for the Seamount survey blog and also a link to YouTube. Um, there are six um, videos in the series, so I showed you two of them. Um, and there's other ones that I highly recommend you watching. OK, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Round of applause. <laughs> you can unmute yourselves now as well, everyone. Um, if you would like to. So <laughs> thank you so much. Um, that was that was absolutely fascinating. Um, I loved seeing the videos. I loved seeing everything in action. Um, and it's really great to see 
uh, so much going on, uh, particularly linking to the AM. But um, now we would like to run a Q&A session. Um, so if people have questions, feel free to please unmute yourself. Um, and you can also show your video if you like um, to ask Letitia some questions. Or if you're feeling a bit shy, you can uh, put a question in the chat and I can... Um, read it out to Letitia if you would like. So yeah, if we just open up the floor now, if you'd like. So are there any questions for Letitia at all? Everyone's feeling very quiet. Um, I just had a, a quick question about the RV investigator um, itself. So this one, you said it ran in 2017. Um, do you know how often they generally run these expeditions at all? Or Oh, um, so the deep water ex ex uh, ones or just uh, in general? Um, both. Uh, I think it's, yeah, it's a really interesting um, research vessel. Yeah, I, I believe in general, um, over the year, it's operational over 300 days of the year. I think, oh. I believe it's it's operational pretty much all the time. Um, the deep water voyages, I, I guess it depends who's um, applied for ship time at that moment. Um, so there was, um, to the Great Australian Bight, there were um, a number of cruisers that went there um, because that was part of a wider scheme. Um, the Eastern Abyss, that was one. Um, so I, I guess it sort of depends on who wants to um, investigate what which areas. Yeah. No, sounds sounds yeah. awesome. Um, anyone else? Anyone else have any questions? It's an open forum, so you can unmute yourselves. I know that everyone has been careful to mute themselves and turn off their video. So I have a question. If I can ask. Yeah, of course. Hi. 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 <laughs> um, thanks for a great talk. Um, I was interested, so you listed a number of genera there um, and you're saying that these are new species in those genera. Um, now, I don't know much about polychaetes, so pardon my <laughs> lack of knowledge on polychaetes. Um, but do you find similar, do you find the same genera, sorry, uh, in coastal waters, so things that are much more on the continental platform, much uh, shallower water, do you find those same genera in just different species or are they completely different communities of different genera? entirely in the shallow waters? Oh, that, that's a really good question. Um, so generally you do find the same uh, genre in so shallow waters and deep seas, but you don't tend to find the same species. Although um, some of the species descriptions are quite vague, so species have been recorded from shallow waters and deep seas. Um, but then when you sort of go back to look at it again, perhaps using molecular methods, um, we find that they're not the same species and they're different. Um, so yes, in answer to your question, yes, you do generally find them, but they're different species. Ah, thanks. That that makes a lot of sense. It's generally sort of matches what, what I found with invertebrates in the fossil record. So yeah, that seems to be matches as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, thanks, Pat. Any um any other questions for Letitia at this time? Don't be shy. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> um. Okay. Well. Uh, thanks everyone for joining and thank you so much Letitia again for an amazing talk. Um, I just wanted to let people know as well that we have um, recorded this talk as well. We'll see what it, it looks like and if um, people missed out or if you're interested just shoot me through an email about that. Um, but otherwise thank you everyone for joining and thanks Letitia again. Yeah. <laughs>